afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Gordon Current Science and Technology stage. My name is Corrine, and I will be your host as we talk about making molecular movies with the QStore. And to begin, I want you to give a great big round of applause to our special guest researchers. We have, we have Beth Brainerd, Chi Yang, Jessica Winter, and Peter Kner. Now, you'll notice that they hail from four different universities, and they're experts in four different fields of science. And a team of us here at the Museum of Science, we are also part of this collaboration. It's our job to tell the story of their research. Now, we do invite you to follow along this research in progress. It's ongoing right now, and you can find out more about it at qstorm.org. If you visit the website, you'll notice that we're under a little bit of pressure because we have just four years of funding to make this major breakthrough in biological imaging, to make movies of what tiny uh, molecular machines are actually doing inside living cells. It's pretty incredible. Now, our funding comes from the Innovations in Biological Imaging and Visualization Program of the National Science Foundation. Now, we're gonna take a step back and uh, I'm going to begin by showing you a metaphor for this incredible movie-making challenge that we face. This is a time-lapse video of a 15-story hotel in China being constructed. As you watch that video, I want you to look carefully and notice what kinds of things must be going on inside that building that are perhaps details that are too small for us to see. Any ideas? any people in there? Pardon me? No, you can't really see much going on in there, but there must be construction workers. They must have tools. They're putting systems in place like electrical and wiring systems and plumbing systems. There are a lot of details that are happening inside that building as it's being constructed that we just can't see from this perspective. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as we watch another video. Now, this one is at a much smaller scale. In fact, this movie was shot through a microscope. Now, to orient you before we begin, this is a group of cells from the lining of a kidney. Each cell is about 20 microns in size. They've been magnified 15,000 times to be this size on the screen. The cell bodies have been stained green and the nuclei have been stained red. And if you look at those orange squiggles in the center cell, inside the bright green spot, which is the nucleus, those are the chromosomes of that cell's nucleus. Now, watch carefully. Does anybody know what we just saw? Any ideas? Um, the two orange things Yeah, it's separated. Basically, what we saw was cell division. One parent cell splitting into two daughter cells with the identical genetic material. It's one of the wonders of the biological world. There must be probably some things going on in there, just like with the building construction, maybe details happening that are too small to see. Let's watch again. What do you guys think? There's a lot of intricate details that we can't see. What do you think are making those chromosomes align and then pull apart? What kinds of molecular motors might be responsible for perhaps pinching the cell membrane together to split that cell into two. There are so many intricate details that we can't really visualize here. This process of cell division is just one of millions of different molecular scale activities that are going on in all of our cells all the time. And biologists who study life would love to be able to see those kinds of activities up close, just like the two biologists on our QStorm team. Ji Yang and Beth Brainerd. Beth Brainerd is a biologist at Brown University, and her and her team of students, they study muscles. So Beth wants to be able to understand what's happening at the molecular scale inside muscle cells as they extend and contract during movement. And our other biologist, Ji Yang, is a bioengineer at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. He studies nerves. 
And G and his team, what they're trying to understand is the transport system inside nerve cells. What happens when it breaks down and potentially leads to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's? So both Beth and G would like to be able to see a great deal deeper into the cellular systems that they study. In an ideal world, they'd be able to see movies of these tiny molecular machines at work inside nerve cells and inside muscle cells. Ideally, they'd see something like this. Now this is an artist's animation of the transport system inside a white blood cell. That big blue balloon-like structure is a cargo vessel. It's being dragged by that motor protein along a microtubule track. That motor protein, even though it looks like something that maybe Pixar would create, the movement of that motor protein has actually been scientifically validated. It actually has two little molecular feet that grab and release, grab and release, pulling its cargo along these microtubule highways. This is how many of the resources actually get distributed inside our living cells. Keep in mind though, this is just an animation. It's not a real movie. And that's because no one will ever be able to actually make a real movie at this level of detail inside living cells. And that's because these structures are nanoscale structures. They are so tiny, they're even smaller than wavelengths of visible light. So a light microscope couldn't possibly resolve those kinds of details. For example, let's look at this motor protein. It's about, uh, made of a few thousand atoms. It's about 30 nanometers in size, which is much, much smaller than a wavelength of visible light. You can think kind of like an ocean wave crashing over a pebble on a beach. The presence is hardly even registered. Now, if researchers want to pinpoint these molecules, what they do is they attach a tiny light source to it. And if we put on a little light source to it and look at that under a microscope, we'd see this a great big 200 nanometer blur of light. It doesn't really have much detail, does it? And that's because 200 nanometers is the smallest point of visible light that can possibly be detected by a light microscope. We just can't see anything smaller. It's the absolute physical limit of these optical microscopes. So you can imagine what a problem that would be if you're trying to track a few molecules that are closer than 200 nanometers apart. Well, all you see is a bunch of overlapping blurs. That physical limit, that problem in getting resolution below 200 nanometers is why our biologists, G and Beth, went to our microscopist, Peter Kinner, for some help. Now, Peter is, as I mentioned, a microscopist from the University of Georgia, and his team of students, they know how to make a special type of microscope that can get past the ordinary limits of light microscopy. They basically use a special technique to make much higher resolution images of tiny subcellular structures. And they do it with a technique called STORM. Which, if I'm honest, actually has nothing to do with weather. STORM is, is actually an acronym. STORM is an acronym for an imaging technique that stands for Stochastic Optical Reconstruction Microscopy. You don't need to worry about those big words, we'll get back to them. But this STORM technique can get past the physical uh, limits of, of ordinary optical microscopes. It was invented at Harvard in 2006 by Zhao Wei Zhuang. And now this technique is used in, in labs like Peter's to be able to make much higher resolution images. So how does the storm technique get past this 200 nanometer optical limit? Let's look at this uh, image taken with a standard optical microscope. These microtubules inside a cell have been stained with a blue fluorescent dye. That blue fluorescent dye gives off light in the form of photons. A microscope captures those photons and it is able to make this image. Now, if you look at that scale bar, you see that the gold square is about three microns in size. If you think about a small square like a postage stamp, that square represents an area that's actually 10,000 times smaller than a postage stamp. So already we have pretty good detail at a very fine, very small size. But if we try to zoom in, to that area bounded by that gold square, all we see is 
a bunch of square pixels representing some pattern of light has been detected. It doesn't give us the detail that we want. Now compare that with the image on the right taken with the storm technique. You can see that it has much greater detail. Those are the same microtubules, this time in green, and we do have that extra detail that we want. How does the storm technique get such better resolution? Now I'll give you a hint. The image on the left is one single image where all the points of light are basically blurring together. The image on the right, though, is actually a computer-generated reconstruction, essentially a stacking of thousands of images, each one capturing only a few pinpoints of light at a time. Let me tell you a story that might make this a little bit more clear. Imagine that you're out on a dark and foggy night and you see this blurry apparition on the horizon. Now you can tell it's a big structure that's all lit up, but you can't really make out the details. Now, you happen to know an electrician in that part of town, and you ask her to do you a favor. Would she turn off most of those lights, leaving just a random few of them on at a time? So it's a slow night, she decides to humor you, and after she turns off most of the lights, this is what you see. Just a random few of the lights are still on. Now what you do is you carefully pinpoint the center of each one of those little tiny blurs of light, you carefully do that for each little blurry light that you see, and when she turns off the lights, she turns on the next random subset of lights. And again, you repeat that process, carefully pinpointing the center of each little point of light that you see. That process is called localization. And you're gonna repeat it with each new subset of lights over and over and over again. And as you repeat this through thousands of different subset of lights, you're gonna do this all night until the coffee runs out, you're exhausted. And at the end, you're going to stack all of those pinpointed images. Well, what do you think you're gonna see? In this case, you see the Eiffel Tower. You didn't know we were in Paris for this demonstration, did you? Now, this is actually just a visual analogy, but it reveals the essence of how storm imaging works. You have stochastic or random blinking of lights, and then you very carefully detect and localize the center of each one of those points of light. And then basically you can reconstruct a much more detailed image. Only instead of using this to make detailed reconstructions of large buildings, researchers are using this technique to make reconstructions of tiny subcellular structures and get very high resolution images inside cells. You probably noticed that the storm technique requires very bright light sources. In fact, the more light or the more photons we have, the higher resolution image we can create. So let's go back to this image we saw before. Researchers created this image by attaching green fluorescent dyes to tiny microtubules inside cells, getting those dyes to basically blink on and off, detecting that light, and reconstructing an image that we see here. If we want more resolution, which we do, the QSTORM researchers would love to be able to see something as small as a motor protein moving along the microtubule track. Well, we need more resolution, and that means we're going to need more light. We need more photons. And that's why G, Beth, and Peter all came to Jessica Winter for help. Jessica is a chemical engineer at Ohio State University, and her and her team, they are quantum dot specialists. Quantum dots are tiny nano-sized crystals that when you excite them with a laser, they give off light very brightly and they glow. And as you can see here, they glow different colors. They can be tuned to give off different wavelengths of light. And they're much brighter and longer lasting than traditional fluorescent dyes. So I have my own set of quantum dots up here. And you can see when I activate them with a UV light that they glow quite brightly they give off this very bright color. And that brightness, that ability to give off so many, many photons, is why Jessica and her team think that we might be able to use quantum dots to improve uh, the resolution of storm imaging. Jessica and her team, they're hard at work in their lab uh, designing quantum dots that can be safely used inside living cells. But there's something else very important that they need to get these quantum dots to be able to do. This is a little hint. What are the lights doing? What do we need for storm imaging? 
the ideas. We need them to, to blink on and off. So Jessica basically needs to get her quantum dots to be off or on, off or on, on command. She essentially needs a light switch for her quantum dots, and they don't come with light switches. So what's she gonna do? Well, her team had an idea about how to use a tiny gold nanoparticle to control the quantum dot. Basically, a gold nanoparticle, when it gets close enough to that quantum dot, it absorbs the energy that would otherwise be given off as light, so the quantum dot goes dark. When that gold nanoparticle moves away, the energy can again be released as light, so it lights back up. The gold nanoparticle comes close, the quantum dot goes dark. As it moves away, the quantum dot lights up again. The gold nanoparticle is essentially a light switch for that quantum dot. Now, how are we gonna control the movement of that gold nanoparticle? That's another engineering challenge we need to solve. And Jessica's team had a great idea about how to do this using a linker molecule. That linker molecule is actually so top secret they've applied for a patent, and I can't tell you a lot about it yet. But I do have this model to show you basically how it works. So this is a gigantic model of a glowing quantum dot, and this represents my gold nanoparticle over here. And the slinky represents that linker molecule. Now by controlling the length of the linker molecule, we can control how far or close the gold nanoparticle is. So basically, as the linker molecule shrinks and it gets close, that gold nanoparticle shuts off. As we extend the linker molecule, the gold nanoparticle moves away, it lights back up. So essentially, this linker molecule can control whether or not the quantum dot is on or off. So Jessica's team is really excited about finding this way to, con to switchably uh, control a quantum dot, turn it on or off on command. Now that is exactly the key we need to put the Q in Q store. Q stands for the quantum dots that the team hopes to be able to use to improve the resolution of storm imaging and make this major breakthrough in biological imaging. Now we heard a little bit about what Jessica's team is up to, but where is the rest of the team in terms of their research? Well, G is hard at work in his lab figuring out how to get those quantum dots into the nerve cells that he wants to study. And Beth is working on labeling the molecules in muscle cells that she wants to study and send the samples to Peter. And Peter is at work at his lab working to be able to see deeper into living oh. samples. You can think about our team. I mentioned they're making these molecular movies. They really are a movie-making team. If you think about Peter as our cameraman with his microscope, Jessica is the lighting technician with her quantum dots, and she and Beth are the movie's directors, deciding which cells to zoom in on and what action to capture. And speaking of movies, we had some uh, students at the New England Institute of Art work on this project. They wanted to make a superhero cartoon adventure of our uh, researchers here, and I thought you might like to see it. You'll notice at the beginning, the researchers are a little frustrated by the challenges they can't overcome on their own until they work together to make this big breakthrough. There's G. Thank the National Science Foundation for supporting this work.